I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Today, I am not dressed up just for you. I am going to an aerial show afterwards, which I am proud to say is being put on by my much more accomplished friends. Today's topic is Indigenous equals self-generating. This is primarily comments that I've been saving for a while on Douglas Jack. He is someone who's been reading my Substack for at least a year, maybe the whole two years that I've been putting it out. And he's been writing comments that I've been saving in a draft form because I've been wanting to focus on this for a while. It is very encouraging and don't we need that. First, Douglas gives a little bit of background, and I'll be reading this in snippets and then giving some commentary. I started 60 years ago, 1963, in solidarity projects with First Nations and Indigenous people worldwide, living and working with folks and many elders. One earlier overview of Indigenous structures in 1972 for me is called the Indigenous Circle of Life. It came from meeting with Sun Bear, also known as Vincent Leduc, an Ojibwe in British Columbia. Vincent is father of Winona Leduc, VP candidate with Ralph Nader. Circle of Life provides interdisciplinary checks and balances in harmony with human and biosphere nature over many tens of thousands of years of vibrant, abundant, distributed agency and wealth in loving societies. And then he gives the link for that, and all of this will be at substack.com backslash third paradigm. The overall Indigene Community Info website contains a table of contents list on the left-hand side with some 77 web pages, sections each with its own URL describing various aspects of Indigenous social, economic, and biosphere techniques and structures. And then Douglas responds to my recent post on Fiddler on the Truth. Coming from mixed Christian, Ashkenazi, some of my family in three branches, Jewish and First Nation heritage, I now at 71 years old consider the Torah, Talmud, Old and New Testament, and Quran, as well as explanations, all to be fake books of colonial propaganda glorifying conquest, genocide, and murder by a murderous God designed to indoctrinate subject peoples for acquiescence to these ongoing death cult policies, even more augmented in our time. Real religion, Latin religio, means to relate, not to indoctrinate or dominate, is not a one-sided propaganda monologue, but would express both sides of issues. Real religion would give voice to such as the Canaanite, Amalek, Philistine perspective, as well as the violent, conquering, murderous, self-righteous Jew. We can consider all the supposed people of the book cults as false exogenous, meaning other-generated, religions. Since you know me to be an etymology freak, I love it that Douglas goes back to the Latin and Greek origins of words. And religion, meaning to relate, fits so well with my idea that religion should be a place where we're asking the big questions and comparing our answers to them. I think that he's on to something about all of these fake religions being ways to indoctrinate and get acquiescent from subject peoples. And that's where I think we maybe are mistaking that when we talk about the Jews, the actual Judeans, whoever was being talked about in those New Testament stories, in the Gospels, was being taught how to be a slave because that's what those people who were never called Jews ended up being. So I think we need to look at these not as empowering scriptures, but ones that serve their purpose by making people into slaves. Douglas writes, Truth and Reconciliation 
Indigenous Great Spirit, God, worldwide cultivates counsel process, enabling dialogue among all sides. Starting 120 years ago, the Palestinians simply asked the Ashkenazi refugee to engage in, upon arriving from Europe, along with the welcome economic inclusion and protection which the Palestinians at first provided. Council on both sides now, equal time, recorded and published dialogues, enables understanding, fosters collaborative agreement, working contracts, and conflict resolution. And then there's a link for that. This is very similar to what I was reading from that text talking about how Germany had decided that it wanted to end this animosity. It saw itself as someone who could be a bridge and could incorporate the Jewish people who were fleeing from Russia. And that did not turn out well for the Germans. I also remember reading that when the first refugees came from Germany into Palestine, that the Palestinians welcomed them, and that one of the first ships was blown up by the Zionists because they didn't want that. They didn't want that to be a place that harbored inner connections. Instead, they wanted to present this hostile narrative so that that could be used in order to obliterate the Palestinians. This was really news to me. Douglas writes, Before and during World War II, over 50 Axis-aligned nations joined together in aligned collaborating governments as part of tripartite Pact of Steel agreements and alliances with, and these are the countries, Germany, Italy, Vichy France, Belgium, Netherlands, Austria, Hungary, Croatia, Serbia, Albania, Slovakia, Crecia, originally Soviet Union, Romania, Montenegro, Macedonia, Greece, Crimea, Bulgaria, Denmark, Norway, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, Spain, Italy, Syria, Iraq, Palestine, Libya, Morocco, Tunisia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, West African Dakar, Azad Hind India, Jammu, Kashmir, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Burma, Indonesia, Philippines, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Manchuria, and Inner Mongolia. So that's all listed. It shocked me to finally tally, he writes, that the Axis movement had over 50 nations involved, organizing that much worldwide concentration in just a couple of decades was truly a remarkable feat. My issue is how, following World War II, with all blame and one-sided show trials, all blame was assigned to the Axis losers, and brutal Allied winners have continued on our genocidal mission worldwide, unhampered at an increasingly murderous and destructive pace. You may think that that would be discouraging because all those countries together didn't change anything. But to me, because I never even knew that side of the history, it's very encouraging to know that all of that alliance is possible. And it reminds me that Russia is not Putin any more than any of us are whatever puppets are in charge of us. But that's something that has been throughout history, where people are bonded together and they have this collective intelligence and they do not want war. So it makes me think that perhaps we're not misguided to think that the things that are happening today in terms of shifting things towards this multipolar world could turn out well, no matter what there is that the oligarchs have in mind. Douglas writes about the economic engine of popular empowerment. These 50-plus Axis-aligned governments and aligned populations, 
were supportive of the multi-stakeholder participatory corporation laws, constitutions, and policies found within the 12 main access powers, which required all corporations over 30 employees to convene voting share ownership of all stakeholders, which means workers, founders, managers, supplier, townspeople, and consumers in various combinations. Participatory accounting enabled those countries and collaborator populations to gain local control of their means of production and livelihood, not available in the oligarch-commanded and controlled colonial empire extractive and exploitative colonial allied British, French, Belgium, Netherlands, USA, Canada, Australia countries. And yes, I am aware that the World Economic Forum is exploiting that term, stakeholder capitalism, and they're looking at it as including investors. So we need to take back the words and not let them control what they mean, because we don't have alternatives for how to express this participatory government And I think that we can't just let them have those terms. Douglas writes, Depression recovery, success of Germany under the National Socialist derived from issue of labor scripts or certificates of labor, time, and tasks. German, Austrian, Hungarian, Korean, Japanese, indigenous, self-generating, economic background of participatory ownership also involves corporate, institutional, and government time-based equivalency accounting practices. Real socialism, and he says socialist equals friend, involves people who know each other, operating in control of their local enterprises, not the false communist, together, gift, or service, basically imposed on Russia through Lev Davidovich Bronstein Trotsky and Vladimir Lenin financed with millions of 1917 U.S. dollars and armed by the New York Stock Exchange leader Jacob Schiff and Schiff's colleague Germany's financier Warburg. Both real socialism and communist are defined to be bottom-up people powered through time-based equivalency accounting in economic democracy. Once again, don't let them own the words, because that leaves us with no way to be able to talk about concepts. Whenever you talk to anyone, make sure they define what the word means to them. And in the end, etymology wins. We have to go back to the roots. So these are things that are being taken from us, and we need to own these concepts And start with things like, what's the scale? If something is bottom up, then the critical unit is going to be the one at the bottom. That is a community, not an individual, because an individual cannot stand against a global organization of one corporate government. Douglas writes, and I won't try to pronounce the indigenous words, I'll just give the meaning. From humanity's worldwide indigenous point of view, in the great good way of kindness, also known as great law of peace, also known as constitution, what the Axis missed out on was the importance of accounting, recording, and valorizing collective domestic economy contributions, experience, expertise, and decision-making acumen, mostly women, in the multi-home dwelling complex, like the Longhouse Apartment, Pueblo Townhouse, and Canada Village, where 70% of people lived then and now. Indigenous tradition puts the domestic economy as the core economy, with industry and commerce, mostly men, being subset economies. Honoring collective domestic work, such as many women take leadership in, should be front and center of every economic and social justice and livelihood movement. Any man worth his salt should be empowering female ownership and decision-making 
on this equal, decentralized, distributed, cultural, fractal basis. Can you imagine if the Axis had formalized multi-home participatory ownership? What a difference that would have made. There most likely would have been no war, regardless of the bloodthirsty warmonger Churchill. Of course, to realize relational economy, humanity has to become conscious of the exogenous, other-generated programming. When we look at this as a competition between men and women, we're looking at it from a masculine point of view. That's what the business world says everything's about. And not looking at what is it that is our purpose in life? Caring for the people and places that have been entrusted to us. And women, mothers, are at the center of that. This is the world that we're looking to create. And so it's not who has the power. It's who's taking the responsibility. And that's where the decision-making should belong. Douglas then goes into some detail about the size of these multi-home dwellings that 70% of people live within. And this is from 50 to 100 people, so 32 units on average, and looks at this as the fractal, that this is the first proximal fractal, the building block where the part contains the whole of collaborative economic livelihood. He writes, 20% of multi-home dwellers are extended family living intentionally in proximity for social and economic collaboration. Multi-home extended family contribute $2 trillion of the most individually appropriate good services sharing caring per year as Turtle Island, North America's largest essential economic sector, albeit unrecognized by government, education, and institutions. He asks, do we know who we are? And then he gives another website that is a community circular economy software that supports individuals, family, extended family, community recognition of each person, and entity's contribution, experience, expertise, and decision-making acumen. This is where my economic plan, I feel, builds on Douglas's concept, which of course is not Douglas's, is this worldwide concept. And what I do is an accounting form that gives flexibility so that that 20% of extended family within these communities has the objective and the fostering to be able to welcome others in, but also to keep their integrity intact. I find that creating your own culture, it's very difficult as a family because you're fighting against all of these things that are trying to impose their cultures on you. And I think that that same thing is true for any community. You need to be able to prioritize your own culture. And what my economic system does, I feel, is give you the tools to do that. On the Substack, I've included a clip of Vandana Shiva talking about why handing over the word regenerative to people like Monsanto is not a benefit for what we want to accomplish. Even though they're going to publicize it, they're going to make it mean the opposite. And I had made that analogy way back when the boys took my phrase tonic masculinity and made it mean the opposite. And I said, what if regenerative came to mean this industrial GMO agriculture? And then it happened just like that. So Douglas writes, and I'll end with this, history from both sides. Being on the indigenous, self-generating side of history One does not accept the ally or axis exogenous programs, but does recognize both have good intentions. Searching out a perceived opponent's best intentions is the first rule of Gandhian, Swadeshi, Hindi, indigenous, 
animism and satyagraha, truth search animism, incomplete but complementary fragments of the whole, ally oligarch empires, genocided 25 million people in their colonies during 1920 to 45, economic democracy, the Axis nations' economies, and he says economies comes from oikos equals the home, and naaman means care and nurture, and I talk about that in my book. We're all based on multi-stakeholder participatory investment, board representation, and decision-making powers, typically among the family business of Japan, of Korea, the associative economies of Germany, Austria, Hungary, the fashy united bundles of sticks, which are strong in Italy and Romania, Zadruga, Slavic for friend of Yugoslavia and Ukraine, empower all stakeholders to invest and progressively own a founder, worker, manager, supplier, townspeople, consumer, etc. lifetime. Invested share interest, profit sharing, and involvement in decision making creates individual and collective responsibility as well as a collective intelligence. Hence, particularly Germany and Japan are renowned worldwide for their stakeholder integrated engineering excellence. This kind of bottom-up popular unity on the part of Axis is completely incomprehensible to the totally controlled mind and lives of empire allies. It's time to recognize all sides of this human equation we're in. I'm not sure if I completely track with Douglas on this. I worry that taking the feminine economy of this indigenous cultures and putting that into the business world would end up being co-opted the way that regenerative is being co-opted by Monsanto. My feeling is that what we need to do is take the actual homes and have that be the basis of the home economy. And that's what my system does because I take our future labor and say, we who inherit these homes based on a debt do owe something to future generations and to past generations. We owe them the care and nurture and to take care of the places. So this is something that we can have an accounting process around, which is what my book describes. And I think that that, bringing the economy home, is the first step. To follow this up, I'm going to go back to David Graeber and Indigenous Communities with Muskrat Love and Anarchy, and this is When Mothers Ran the World. Thank you for watching.